Good morning, New Bethel. Good morning. Well, glad you're here to worship. Let's uh, begin with uh, finding where is that place where you get alone with God and where he has a chance to make a change in your thinking and your way of life and your way of thinking about him and how you can serve him. That's what we're going to sing about first here. It's called In the Secret.
think the world needs to know Jesus we, as we think about it we look around so much of what we see in the world is just a lack of Jesus and so we need to be the ones as believers in Jesus that make him known that's our job one of the ways that we do that is by worship by praising him if we worship him from our hearts then there people outside of Jesus are attracted to him. So as we're going to continue in worship in a moment, we want to, that's what we want to pray. We want to pray that we would be one, that others would know Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for, the, for bringing us into oneness with Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to have the gift of salvation, for giving us everything necessary for salvation, and for encouraging us then to make that choice, to believe in our hearts and to confess with our mouths. And Lord, as one with you, we want to be one with one another, with all believers all around the world, joining together our hearts and praising Jesus so that the world would know him. And Father, that's our call. That's our, that's our prayer today. We ask that you would take this time of worship, our time of Bible study, and that you would use these things in our lives to honor Jesus and to make him known throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Let's continue to worship. In Christ alone
Welcome back to our sermon series called Community. We're back in chapter 12 of the book of Romans and need to tie back into how you fit into this concept of community. We were introduced to the idea of community in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12. In that passage, we were to base our actions upon the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we saw explained and illustrated in those first 11 chapters of the letter to the Romans. Then in verse 1 and 2, we discovered that based on the gospel, we are to give ourselves not only to God, but also to service, to the service of others as we follow the example of Jesus. Now, now last week we did jump ahead just a little bit to chapter 13. We looked at the Christian's role as a citizen. But this week we're, we're back looking at our individual part as a member of the community that we call church. To present today's idea, I want you to think first about um, the greatest football quarterback. Now, put him in a game by himself against the Tennessee Titans. Last year, the Titans were an average team. They were, in fact, looked to me like right in the middle of the NFL standings. So how do you think the very best quarterback ever would do by himself against an average NFL team? I think he'd get slaughtered. The team would win. Uh, you like baseball better? Okay, make it the best pitcher against an average mi major league team. Still really no contest. How about if you took the best quarterback or the best pitcher and you put them up against the teams from, say, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga? Still no contest. The teams would win. Today we're going to see that it is our role to play to play our part on the team. We're not to go out on our own. God has placed us in a community of believers so that we might play a part. The illustration the Lord uses is not a team, but the human body. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Follow along with me. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word and for this encouragement. We pray, Father, that you would apply this word to our lives today. Help us to know how we fit into the community of faith that is the body of Christ, that is your church here in this place. Father, lead us today as we think and as we consider your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We began this chapter with these words. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Now, this, step, this statement sets the stage for a complete discussion, not only on the application portion of the book, but also on the framework where it is to be applied. We are family, brothers and sisters. We are community. We've probably all seen cases where one child in the family is favored over the others, the best biblical example is probably Joseph. Jacob favored Joseph over his other sons. And as a result of that favoritism, there was jealousy and hatred. And we kind of see the problem expanded when Joseph explains his dreams to his brothers without any humility at all in the telling of it. It comes across to those who were already jealous as arrogance. And that too added to the problem. We're not to participate in such things. 
The first thing we see in our passage today is that in the community, we should be humble. Our first word for today is humility. We're told not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. What does that mean? What is proper thinking of oneself? I think that question depends on the comparison. If the world tells you you are worthless, think about how God sees you. You are so valuable, Jesus died for you. You are a child of the King. You're an heir with Christ Jesus. You have an endlessly glorious, eternal home in heaven. However, when compared to others in the community, we are all one. Galatians 3.28 says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male, there's no female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, in God's eyes, we're all the same. We are equal in God's eyes. God does not play favorites. We were all sinners. Now we're all saved by grace. The same faith that saved me saved you. The same Lord that offered me forgiveness offered you forgiveness. That's how we should think of one another. It is possible that there was a little pride, a little much too high thinking in Rome. It was the capital city of the civilized world for hundreds of years. But here we're told that it does not matter where you are from, you should not think too highly of yourself. It doesn't matter what your job, you should not think too highly of yourself. We should think about ourselves with sober judgment. We shouldn't deceive ourselves about who we think we are, and at the same time we should not deceive ourselves about who someone else is in the community of faith. The person who quietly serves the Lord behind the scenes for many faithful years, never being noticed or receiving any recognition, will hear Jesus say, well done. We should treat one another with humility. Next, we're to relate to one another according to faith. Faith, okay, I have to admit, I, I really wanted to put fidelity in here instead of faith because it kind of humility, fidelity, see what I mean? I didn't want to confuse anybody with the terminology. What we see is that we're to think about ourselves in this community based on the faith given to us. We're to relate to others according to the faith given to both of us and them. We're to recognize the value of each member of the community based on the faith that God gives. Faith is confidence. Faith is loyalty. Faith is trust. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not something you can run to Walmart and buy. You, you can't go online and order faith from Amazon. Faith is a gift, but it's not even something that you can give to someone else. Faith is God's gift to individuals. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Which part of that verse, which part of the gift is that talking about in the verse? Uh, obviously, salvation is a gift. You cannot earn it. Grace, too, is a gift. You can't earn it either. And faith is a gift. God gives us the ability to believe and to trust in Him. Without faith, we can neither believe nor trust. Simply knowing is not enough. The demons knew Jesus. but They didn't believe He could save, and they certainly didn't trust Him for salvation. Faith is a tool that God uses to distinguish between those who belong to Jesus and those who do not. When Jesus said to those who had done works of mercy and service, he, he said, depart from me, the difference between those that did the same things, the difference was their faith. It appears that those that Jesus said, depart from me, had faith in their works rather than faith in Jesus. See, faith makes all the difference. And faith sustains us in this life. Though you have not seen him, 
you love him. And even though you do not now see him, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. What we have in common as believers in Jesus, as a part of this community of the church, is faith. Faith ties us together. Through faith, we are saved, and through faith, we are joined in community. The next thing we see in this passage, um, in Romans 12, 4 and 5, is this. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individuals, individually members one of another. Through faith we are one body. Through faith we are individually members one of another. So our next word is unity. We have unity. Being one, being a part of community is critically important. We began today with the idea of the best quarterback or the best pitcher not being able to win by themselves. Neither can we as believers. We are to be unified as believers into one body. And as we think about the church, into one community. We're to work together. We're to share joy and grief. We're to support and encourage one another. We're to bear with one another and to build up one another in the community of faith. Unity is so important that Jesus made it a central and vital part of his final prayer with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. Listen to this part of Jesus' prayer from John 17, 20 to 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Three times in this portion of Jesus' prayer, he says that we may be one. And the last time he says that they may be perfectly one. So we're to be unified in belief. We're to be unified in the glory of Jesus. And we're to be perfectly unified as we are joined to the Father through Jesus. This is a theme that we're going to see repeated later in chapter 12, also in chapters 14 and 15 of Romans. Unity was a mark of the early church in the book of Acts. It was written of by Peter, the letters to the Corinthians and the Galatians and the Ephesians and the Philippians and the Colossians all contain admonitions and instructions to protect and to participate in the unity of believers of faith. David began Psalm 133 with the words, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, that's those of us who are in the community of faith, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Being unified, having unity does not mean we all look alike. While we're all to protect, while we are, in fact, to protect the unity, we're to do that while celebrating the diversity. Diversity. We are to recognize and celebrate the diversity that God has placed among us in our community. Again, the, the illustration is of the human body. Take a look at your palms. Go ahead. Take a look at your palms. Are the wrinkles and lines of your hands identical? Mine are not. The human body, yours and mine, have a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. God has designed the human body with a multitude of functions and systems. Without the skeletal system, you couldn't stand. Without the muscular system, you couldn't move. Without the nervous system, you couldn't do either one of those. 
no digestive system, and you would not be able to gain the energy necessary to run all the other systems. If your circulatory system is cut off, you'll cease to have any functions. And within each system, and there are many more, within each system, there are parts which function to keep that system working. All of those different parts and systems were designed by God to make you, you, to make you work. In the same way, you are a part of a community designed by God to do His work in the larger community in the world. Now, now you may be a big part of the community. The biggest organ in your body is your skin. Or you may be a, a small part of the community. Uh, Brian recently had knee replacement surgery because a small piece of protective tissue made up of collagen fibers called the meniscus broke down in his knee and caused the bones to rub together. It seems like a small and insignificant part of the human body. But I can tell you from experience, personal experience, tear your meniscus and your whole body knows that that little part is damaged. We're all made up of many parts, each important, each doing what God designed it to do. God has given us, as a community of believers, various people who have a part to perform. This too was an act, according to Scripture, of His grace. Grace is our final point for today. I, I want to share with you three things about grace very quickly. Number one, grace begins with God. Grace always begins with God. As, as it pertains to our salvation, without God, there would be no grace for a sinner. Sin puts us in direct conflict with God. Sin is rebellion against the holiness of God. Romans 6, 23 declares that the penalty or the payment for sin is death. Without the grace of God, the grace that originates with God, we would be subject to that penalty. Grace makes it possible for sin to be paid for on the cross. And that's number two, grace saves us. Number two, grace saves us. If you think back to the passage from Ephesians, which I mentioned a few moments ago, we are saved by grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. You cannot earn God's favor. You cannot deserve God's favor. And yet you cannot be saved except by God's favor. That's grace. It is by God's grace shown in the deep and abiding love of Jesus for us, that we have the opportunity for salvation. Let me share an illustration. In the play and the movie Les Miserables, there is a thief named Jean. Jean ends up being invited into the residence of a priest who gives him food and a place to stay for the night. In the middle of the night, Jean steals the priest's silverware and runs off. The next morning, the police arrive with Jean in cuffs, caught red-handed with the silverware. Rather than have him punished, the priest gives him grace, and he asks the police to release him. And then he tells them that he gave Jean the silverware, and he asks Jean in front of the police why you didn't also take the candlesticks, which were much more valuable too. Jean Valjean, the thief, did not deserve grace. He deserved punishment. The old priest could have been gracious and just let him go. But grace goes beyond the easy and goes the extra mile. Grace in this instance included not only letting him go and giving, the, giving him the silverware, which he had stolen, but also giving him a pair of even more valuable silver candlesticks. Grace generously saves us. Grace comes from God. Grace saves us. And number three, grace enables us. Look at verse 6 of Romans 12. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. This is not the only time this concept is mentioned in the New Testament. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But grace was given to each one, according to the measure of Christ's gift. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another 
as good stewards of God's varied grace. As seen in these verses, grace is not only God's favor and provision of salvation for us, it is also the means by which we are to operate in the community of believers in Jesus Christ and in the world. Every aspect of who we are can be used by God for the cause of Christ. Our giftedness, our job as Christians is twofold. Number one, to help others come to know Christ, and we are to minister to those who know Him. How we do that is also determined by grace. I want you to think about this acrostic, G-R-A-C-E. Giftedness, relational style, activities, career, and enthusiasm. The G in our acrostic is giftedness. This is the spiritual giftedness that you received when you became a Christian. You might say this is your spiritual birthmark. God has given those members of the community the gifts, the tools necessary for that body, for that community. It's there so that we can do the work that we're called to do as a community. Each one of us has a spiritual gift. Every one of us has a spiritual gift. You need to determine how God has graced you, how God has gifted you. Now, if you need to read through lists, there are lists in the New Testament of spiritual gifts. We're not going to go over those here. And there are variations of those gifts needed in our community and in our church. Paul highlighted uh, gifts in this passage. It began with prophecy, which is, I guess in its simplest definition is speaking the truths of God. That sounds rather important and significant. But that's followed immediately after that with serving, which we think of can be done by anyone. But it is best done by those with a special heart, special giftedness for others. Whether it's teaching or preaching or exhortation or leadership or serving or giving or showing mercy, all are needed and you need to find your place. The R in our acrostic is for relational style. That's how God plumbed you to interact with others. You may relate to others through direct face-to-face -face type A exchange, or you may be, you know, more easygoing and laid back. How you relate to others is a function of how you fit into the community. And the A is for activities, the things you like to do, even your hobbies. God can use the things that you do to provide an outlet for ministry. C is career. God can use the training you receive on the job, your on-the-job training, so to speak, to further His kingdom. Now, that training could come in all kinds of different ways. It could go back to, I don't know, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. It can go back to when you were uh, in college and had a part-time job that you really didn't end up in that career, but you were trained to do something, and God can use your training to further His kingdom. So think about what you have learned in your career. And then the E is enthusiasm. If God has given you a, a special love for something, it's probably the area of ministry that He has graced you to perform. Perhaps your enthusiasm is for children, or praying, or singing or gardening. God can use all of those things to support and encourage and maintain the community that we call New Bethel Baptist Church. G-R-A-C-E. Giftedness, relational style, activities, career, and enthusiasm. How has God graced you to fit into and serve His body, the community of believers? If you're not sure, I want to challenge you this morning to write down each part of the grace acrostic and then fill that in and see where that leads. You can talk to me or one of our staff or another mature believer in Christ to, you know, to help you in that process. The place to begin is in being a part that is being a part of the community. And that beginning is always Jesus. 
If you do not know Jesus, you're not really a part of the body. You're not actually a member of the community. So start there today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this encouraging word. Father, we pray that you would help each of us to realize the blessing that you have given us, that you have given us faith, that you have given us unity, that you have given us diversity. Father, that you have given us the opportunity to serve in the community. And Lord, that you have given us the giftedness that we need to make this community function as it should. Lord, we pray that today you would help each of us to realize the importance of the role, no matter how out front or how behind the scenes it is, that you'd help us to realize the importance of that role and to do it to the very best of our ability as you have given us your grace. And Lord, if there's one today that has realized that in this conversation that they really don't have any spiritual giftedness because they have not received that from you, they haven't been born again, they haven't been born into your kingdom and received the birthmark of a spiritual gift. Lord, I pray that today they would. They would realize that according to your word that they're sinners. They need you. They can't do this on their own. They can't make it on their own. They haven't received your grace for salvation. But Father, they would realize that. They would also realize they'd accept that Jesus is the solution to that. That they would believe in their hearts that he has been raised from the dead, that he is everything Scripture says that he is, that he has done everything that Scripture says he has done. Father, that they would believe and that they would confess. They would speak out with their mouths. They would, they would say out loud, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my leader. Jesus is the one that I trust for salvation, that I have faith in him. Lord, I pray that the day that would happen, that they would be born into your kingdom, that they would become part of your family, that you would bless them with a spiritual gift that fits into the community of faith, that helps them to be the best them that they can be. Lord, we pray that today. We ask that you would bless us as a body of believers, as a community of faith, that, that we would be who we need to be for this community, for our larger community here in Harrison. And Lord, that you would help us to serve our community well, that they too might come to know Jesus as Savior. And that's our prayer not only for Harrison, but for our county, for our state, and for our country. Lord, there's so much turmoil in our country these days, and we know that Jesus is the solution to that turmoil. So we pray, Jesus, for our country, and our state, and our county, and our community. It is in His name we pray that He might tie us all together, make us one, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, if you need to contact me, if we need to talk about a decision that the Lord has laid on your heart today, the contact information will be at the end of this video. And we look forward to speaking face-to-face, -face, well, mask-to-mask now. God bless you. Have a great day.